This, I hope, is Viticulture and Enology 217. And uh, my office is 3001 Wixon Hall. I'm not sure of my office hours yet. I'll give them to you later on. I have some handouts here. Um, one is a schedule of what we're going to try to get through. Order. Let's see, I think maybe you just. That's okay. Major, graduate or undergraduate, BAC T courses you've had. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean in the bacteriology department. I'd like to talk a little bit about the course, the course itself. First of all, the organization of it. You may be a little mystified why it seems like there's so many hours involved, but it's a three-unit course. But it's, we'll go over the, the schedule, and you'll see that it is indeed a three-unit course. On Tuesdays, every Tuesday we'll have a lecture and a lab. But on Thursdays, we will alternate either having a lecture or a lab. It seems to work out the best as far as uh, getting the experiments done that we want to get done and having enough lecture time. Now, the, on Tuesday, the lectures are in here from 1 to 2, and the labs, one section will be in uh, from 2 to 5 over in the Enology building, and the other one, 7 to 10. Now, we can change that, the evening one, when, we, when the people show up this evening, we can make it later or earlier, depending on what you like. On Thursday, and this is important, uh, when we have a lecture, it'll be 1 to 2. Now, ordinarily, the lab then would be from 2 to 5. However, because there is a conflict with this uh, 298 course on um, invited guest lectures, and I think a lot of you would like to go, including myself, what would you think if we had the thir on Thursday, when we have a lecture, we'd have a 1 to 2, but we have a lab, we'd also have it start at 1, 1 to 4, so we'd be done. That seems like a reasonable way to me, and if it's all right with you, if it's not all right with you, let me know. I'd like to talk a little bit about the content of the course, some of the things that we hope that we can get get through. We want to learn, I think, what a wine microbiologist does. And so this means that we have to become acquainted with the organisms that are involved in grapes, even, and in wine, making the making the wine and the storage of wine itself. And this means we want to learn a lot about cultivation of the organisms, their identification, and the control of them. And this so this aspect sounds very much like a techniques course. And in that in that part, that's true. It is a techniques course for the, to that extent. But it has to be a lot more than this, I think. It's very important that you learn something more. For example, say that we do learn about starter yeast. You know how to, you know how to keep your own culture that you want on a slant. We'll learn how to uh, start a small inoculum and build this up to have a nice starter culture. So now you're an expert on, on starting a fermentation. In five years from now, what if they come along and decide, well, we won't use yeast anymore. We're going to use solid uh, support enzymes on a solid support, and we'll just run the grape juice through this column, and we'll get wine out the other end. Well, if that's all you learn, you're not going to be in a very good situation. Um, does that idea intrigue you, by the way, of doing a fermentation that way? Uh, that may be a kind of a bad example uh, to, it's like a far-fetched example. Why probably won't that happen? Anybody have any ideas? Well, it might be expensive, but would it be? Perhaps if these, if these, seem, these enzymes seem to work very well and, and last for a long time and don't need regeneration very much. Uh, the size of the column? Well, in a sense, I think you have a point there. You've got problems with gas coming off. You've got problems with heat. I think heat's a big problem. Any other? Um, I think that's you wouldn't have to worry about contamination. True, that's the point. I think that's not going to happen. It'd be illegal, I think. Uh, but the point, the point I'm making is that if you just learn the techniques and the techniques change, then you're out of luck. You've got to learn, I hope we learn more about what's going on uh, inside the cell, the physiology and metabolism, the control mechanisms, the internal control mechanisms of the organism, of wine yeast and of bacteria and of uh, spoilage organisms too. And I think it's important for you to, to, know, to, keep, to learn how to uh, keep up with what's going on um, other places and in other labs. I think that's one of the things that maybe we can introduce you to some of the ways of keeping up with 
new ideas that you'll that will be are occurring uh, not I'm not saying so much at the university there are some but in other parts of the world and in other um, laboratories and other wineries too that you that you have that you won't have a feeling of isolation once you leave here and a lot of students have said that that they've gotten away to some winery not necessarily a small one either but they really felt isolated they didn't know what was what was going on and I think that it's another aspect of the course, since it is a graduate course, I hope that you would learn how to kind of solve problems of your own, that you won't be afraid to try to, to come up with uh, experiments to, to answer some questions. A good example, uh, there was a short course here last week, I think some of you know that, and one of the questions that was asked, we had a big thing on hydrogen sulfide, and you know, that's, we'll talk about that in class too. We, know some things about it, but we don't know everything by any means. And I tried to give as much information as I could on uh, how to handle it, how to prevent it, and how to get rid of it if, if you had it. Well, at the end of the course, the question came up, if you had this big tank of wine after the, after the primary fermentation, and you started to get, and you got some hydrogen sulfide, specifically, what would you do to get rid of it? And I thought to myself, well, that's what I thought I was talking about for an hour. But then I realized that I had kind of beat around the bush. And so I said, thought to myself, well, what would I do? And what I would do would divide it in, I can think of three things to do, all of them seemingly legitimate. And I think I would do all three. I would take one third, perhaps, and add uh, the minimal amount of copper to get rid of, of um, hydrogen sulfide and then uh, QFX it. Another half, another third I would, I would take to get rid of I would make sure I got rid of all of the yeast that was present, maybe with centrifugation or fining and filtering, and then uh, aerating with SO2, and then watch it later to see if any sulfur, sulfur formed, elemental sulfur, and got rid of that. And the third, I might assume that there aren't very many yeasts there. The man said it was after the first racking. It was rather a clear wine. Maybe just go ahead and aerate and add SO2, and again, look for elemental sulfur, and then fine and filter. Um, I don't know specifically what is the best in this case. There's too many unanswered questions and too many, too many things we don't know about the specific wine. But the point is, if, he, if this man did that, or this woman did that, uh, or if you did it, you would have some idea for next year how to handle the situation better than anybody else, I think, in your situation. And so I hope that we can learn to, to try to be able to answer some questions. And some of the things we're going to do in lab have never been done before. There'll be, um, uh, <laughs> not that you're slave labor to do my research for me, but kind of like that. <laughs> but uh, there are some things that I think it's a good opportunity for us to, to try and, and see if we can get some new kinds of answers. Also, I think it's important that you learn to be able to set up a microbiological lab. Now, this used to be a big part of the course when the course was a little bit smaller. It's kind of difficult to do with so many people. But the media preparation isn't much, in one aspect, isn't much different from than any kinds of reagents that you make for any other course. And you've done this, and you've had some experience in 198s or 199s, I think. Uh, the only difference with making it media, besides a cookbook, is that you need to sterilize it. And you can do this with small uh, autoclaves. You can even use uh, um, pressure cookers, uh, just you know, presto type that uh, it's used in the kitchen, um, if, nothing, if nothing better is, can be found. And I'd like you to be able to not be afraid to make up media. A lot of, lot of uh, media now can be purchased already sterile. And then also there are uh, sterile filtration devices that you can do, use for, that are, that are packed sterile, and you can use them for sterilizing medium. Um, <clears throat> if some of you feel a great deficiency in this part of it and would like to, like to try your hand at making up media or, uh, or doing some experiments, there's a possibility, not this quarter, but if you're here next fall, that maybe we can work out some uh, 298 with you and some other students or with some other professor to actually do some small scale experiment and, uh, in, and in doing that learn how to, to um, uh, sterilized media and, ha know, and learn sterile techniques as far as making uh, a media preparation. I hope that you'll gain a great uh, facility with a microscope. I know you've had some. I want you to be able to be able to handle, to be, become very familiar with the microscope. That's a kind of a thorn in my side at the moment, that, oh, whether we're going to have any microscopes. We'll have microscopes, whether they'll be those as nice of ones as I think we're, we deserve, I don't know, but we'll I'm still holding my, uh, keeping my fingers crossed on that.
Okay, uh, uh, how was the uh, course arranged? Now, you might expect that we would start naturally with uh, grapes and what, what uh, organisms are on grapes and then go to, say, a, uh, a spontaneous fermentation and see what happens during the alcoholic fermentation where you don't add yeast or another case where you add yeast and talk about the fermentation itself and then go on perhaps to uh, secondary fermentation such as the uh, malolactic fermentation and champagne or sparkling wine fermentation, flora fermentation, and also talk about uh, spoilage organisms. Well, that would be the ideal way to do it, but we can't do that just because of logistics. We, we have to start with the things that take the longest time. For example, we, will have, experiment, we have an experiment on malolactic fermentation. Whether we can get that done in two and a half months is a little bit iffy. We're going to try to try to do that experiment by starting today uh, because we want the longest possible time that we can have on this. Um, another experiment that takes some time, we want to look at different strains of wine yeast and see how they vary one from another. That would have to do with uh, the fermentation rate, their sensitivity to alcohol and, and other uh, cold, let's say cold or heat or SO2 and things like this. And then we want to actually taste these wines, too, to see what they taste like. Well, this takes quite a while. You don't want to taste the wine when it's too fresh. So this is an experiment we'll try, we'll start next week. And actually, we're going to talk about the organisms on grapes themselves, one of the very last lectures. Because another thing that takes a while and we need to do it, learn is get some, gain some proficiency in the um, isolation and identification of organisms. So wine yeast, wine bacteria, and spoilage organisms. This is becoming a more and more of a problem, the spoilage organisms, than you might uh, have expected. Uh, and this takes time, too, to, to do this properly. So we'll be starting that very soon. Also, what I would like to do is to have the lectures precede the laboratory material far enough ahead so that you'll know what's going on when you go into the lab. We will have lab lectures. Um, Today, we will probably discuss the lab here because we don't have the chairs set up in the fermentation room. But ordinarily, we will meet in the fermentation room for a short lab lecture to explain what's going on. But I will hope to have had the handouts passed out ahead of time and that we've already had a lecture on this so that you'll have some idea what we're trying to discover in the, ex in the experiment itself. I think it might be well now to go over, to the, go over the schedule. That's one of the handouts I've given you there and talk about some of the things we are going to do, an overall view. Um, <clears throat> today, I want to talk about malolactic fermentation, at least an introduction to malolactic fermentation, so that you'll have something to go on for this experiment that we're starting today. Then next uh, 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 Thursday, we're going to start covering wine spoilage organisms and their cultivation, and also some wine yeast strain characterization. Now, strictly speaking, we shouldn't, talk, shouldn't be talking about strains of wine yeast until we have dealt with identification of yeast. But we do want to start this experiment on different wine yeast strains early, so we'll uh, start that discussion next Thursday. Then we go into yeast identification. You know, Professor Foff and Miller have a whole course, five-unit course devoted to yeast identification. We're going to do it in, a, in a, an hour and a half, but we have a lot easier uh, road to hoe than they do because we're not talking about very many, very many genera or species of yeasts. And in the lab, we will take some spoiled wine and, or some wines, let's say, and try to isolate organisms from them. Um, <clears throat> then we'll, on uh, April 11th, we'll start uh, uh, this wine yeast fermentation experiment where we'll have different yeasts and we will set up wine for, wine for tasting and for fermentation rates. Then on to the 16th, uh, continue yeast identification and do some, learn how to count cells, bacterial and yeast cells um, in a wine, in a population, and start isolation of yeast and bacteria from, say, the wine samples that we worked with the week before. Then we'll talk about control of yeast growth and fermentation. This is a very important as a field uh, uh, subject, which I uh, probably have five minutes worth of <laughs> information, but we'll... Uh, that's not really true, there, but it is interesting that how little note we do, you might, how surprisingly little we know about what happens to yeast, wine yeast, under conditions of wine uh, fermentation. I listed their picnic day, because uh, that Saturday, that I'm going to interrupt myself now to talk about picnic day for a minute. Um, picnic day started out as a, as a student endeavor here, and by and large is in many departments, but somehow it's gotten sidetracked here to be more or less a, uh, 
a, well, somebody's assigned as chairman and he <laughs> grabs some other people and we do what we have to do. But one year, um, I think the quarter system, is, quarter system has kind of fouled this up a little bit. We, you, the, the picnic day is coming within two or three weeks and we've been away on a break and it's just now uh, getting organized and there's not much students can really do uh, in a short time. But one year the students um, made a float for the parade and it was um, a champagne glass with a big champagne bottle pouring bubbly into it and a, a nice uh, label of the Department of Viticulture and Enology. Well, uh, Professor Cleaver is the chairman of Picnic Day this this year, and he resurrected this the the chicken wire frame for the thing, and thought, well, let's uh, do it again. If not, put it in the in the float in the parade, make a float, and put it out in front. So we're hoping that all of you on Friday afternoon <laughs> can get. I think it'd be kind of fun, you know. Uh, uh, see what you can do to put this thing in, in order, and maybe you'll be asked. For, uh, by other professors uh, to help out in doing, making up some displays. I hope so. Um, I may ask you some. I, uh, I won't be here. I'm going to be in LA on uh, that day. So I, <laughs> but I'll, maybe I can get you to help me uh, beforehand. We, we're scheduled, uh, the microbiologists are scheduled to put up a couple of window displays um, in, on this floor and really haven't. Um, told my good help in the back yet about this, but both, both corners, but uh, we're, there's plenty of time. Well, then on to um, uh, wine bacterial identification. Again, uh, this is a course that Professor Starr teaches a whole quarter on, or two quarters, and we're going to do it in one, one uh, session. But again, the wine bacteria are a very small number and not very difficult, relatively speaking, not difficult to identify. Um, <clears throat> We'll do the cell counting in the, uh, in the uh, lab and, and actually start yeast identification then from the yeast that we have isolated hopefully the week before. Uh, now I say in the next one, April 25th, lab continue. All these things, uh, just because it has one lab on there doesn't mean that that's the only one you're going to be do doing. If it just has one experiment, I mean. For example, the malolactic experiment is going to require some, some other things later on. We have to do rackings at various times and analysis of it. So you'll end up that we may be doing five or six experiments at one time, uh, finishing them, and it can be kind of uh, um, hectic and a little bit uh, confusing. We'll try to avoid the confusion by, in the lecture before the lab, of talking about the things that have to be done for each experiment so that it'll come out uh, successfully. Now we're on to uh, April 30th. We have a midterm. And then in the lab, uh, characterization of wine yeast uh, strains, some of these same ones we started uh, much earlier. Then we'll go on to malolactic fermentation. In that lecture, I want to talk, today I want to talk about practical aspects of malolactic fermentation. Then I want to talk about the biochemistry and the intermediary metabolism of the bacteria. And that's a rather good, long subject, and we'll have a, an, a, uh, an hour and a half for that. And then we'll uh, have a summary of all overall uh, view of wine organisms. Continuing the lab bacterial identification and control of, of growth and fermentation. This lecture we talked about earlier will put some of the things we learned in practice to see if we can control growth and fermentation. Um, the uh, next time we're going to have so do something a little bit different. Instead of having a, we'll be scheduled for um, scheduled for a lab, but instead of having a lab, we're going to have some discussions. I'm going to, I think it's important that you do some critical reading of some literature, and there is a very famous paper, definitive paper on hydrogen sulfide by Dr. Rankin from Australia, and we'll all read this, and then we'll get together in small groups. Um, how many there are, how many will be in the group depends on how much stamina I have, but we'll sit together for a half hour or so and just discuss the paper in lieu of having a, uh, uh, a lecture on it. And then the next week we will have a lecture on it. I'll tell you what we should have found out of the paper if, if we didn't find it all out. And we'll talk a little bit about fusel oil. Um, I've I've said uh, on May 9th it says do a Roman numeral 5. That's the results from the fifth experiment and we'll talk about how I want these done in just a minute. Um, <clears throat> 
Let's see, we're down to May 16th in the laboratory. You continue and there's a re literature report and a, and a results of an experiment due. Then on May 21st, we'll have a short quiz. We'll start talking about microbiological stability, thinking especially of semi-dry wines, but, um, but dry wines too. Uh, chemical, physical uh, methods of stabilizing these. And we will have the laboratory. We'll, we'll uh, do experiments on control of isolated organisms. It's not enough to isolate a, a spoilage organism and to identify it. You have to find out something about it if you're going to be able to control it. And this is what we'll do some experiments on that. Now, I've said the, the Thursdays we alternate between lecture and lab. Well, here we had to make a little switch because on May 23rd is the department picnic and we can't have a lab that night for the picnic. And so we've, it should have been a lab and we've switched to have um, a lecture then. Uh, now we're almost to the end here. I um, have a lecture on end, product, end product analysis. This is the, the experiment we've done with various strains of yeast. Now we want to look at the wines to see if we can tell the difference between uh, one strain and, and another strain. For example, did it ferment to dryness or, or did one produce more fusel oils than another or not? And we'll have a lab on aseptic bottling control. It's one thing to, to do aseptic bottling and then the other, another thing to know if you're really doing it properly. And then on May 30th, we'll have a lab, a tasting of these wines that we have made. And hopefully, we'll have enough information ahead of time. If we do a blind tasting, we should be able to identify what yeast strain we used. And then finally, we're going to throw in a lot of material, but it's, there's not a whole lot to talk about, I think. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, sweet wines, uh, sparkling wines, floor fermentation, uh, special research pro reports. I'll tell you about that in a minute. And <clears throat> Uh, well, I left the lab open because it does seem that we're always uh, running short on time and there's no use starting an experiment then. We can finish things that have to be done. And then the last day will be a lecture on enzymatic analyses in wine for you that may, ha may not have had any exposure to this. Talk something about continuous, uh, misspelled, continuous fermentation. And then I think important uh, microbiological and enological literature. Um, I have then listed uh, the different experiments by number and when they're due and, when, they, and what, when certain other things are due. And let's talk about the certain other things that are due now, what I expect from you. First of all, in the lab itself, this is important, that um, I want you to use a very special kind of lab notebook. One, you've heard this before from Kim Five all the way up, but I, I want, it, want you to do it too. That it be a, not a loose leaf bound notebook, that it be in other words, there would be a numbered notebook that if a page is torn out, that somebody would know that. This is, I think it's important that you get in the habit of using this kind of a notebook. Now, I know why people don't like to use it, because it doesn't come out very neat, and doesn't look nice, and it doesn't make a very good impression. Well, I'm not going to look in that notebook. I don't, I'll never, you can show me things if you want to, but I, I won't look in that notebook. I want the results from that notebook put on pieces of paper in another way <coughs> to give to me. So unless you show it to me, you, I won't look into it. But I expect you to have it, not necessarily today, but starting next Tuesday. And you get a zero for that day if I see you writing even your name on a piece of paper, or well, I can't do that, but writing some, you know, some raw data, uh, or you wanted to subtract uh, two numbers. This goes in the notebook. So I hope that's clear. Now what else do we expect? Well, uh, it's a graduate course, and I think you should do something a little bit more than just writing research report, I mean, uh, 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 experiment, reports of experiment, lab reports. As a matter of fact, we aren't going to write very many lab reports. I don't think that they're very helpful. We'll just do, so you won't uh, get out of touch uh, how to do it, we'll write one. So some of the things that I want you to do is to, is to write a lab report on any of the experiments that you want to, just one. And this one will be due then before the last day of uh, classes. Now, I also want a literature report. I'll tell you about that now. This can be short. We're going, I'm not sure exactly how we're going to handle this yet, but we're going to have a list, a bunch of reprints in the library that you can check out to Xerox if you want. And I'd like you, and they'll, they'll be grouped by different subjects, and I'd like you to take one of these and read it carefully and write a short critique for me, uh, your choice. And then now there's a handbook. Let me explain this. This is just 
something for you for later time on kind of a microbiological handbook, how to identify and, and isolate uh, organisms from, um, from wine. And essentially, all it has to be is the handouts that you'll be get, gotten, plus some, liter some, uh, some um, lecture notes, perhaps, plus your results that you yourself got in the lab. Something could be that simple, something so that five years from now, or even two years from now, when all of a sudden you, dis you discover that you're in charge of finding out what the spoilage organism is, you won't panic, that you'll know how to handle it. Um, there's a wine yeast strain, strain report. This one experiment that I've been talking about quite a bit where we're going to use several different strains of yeast. We're going to do a tasting, we're going to do fermentation rate, we're going to do end product analysis, all these sorts of things. I'd like a report and then try to, before the tasting, be able to know, uh, have some idea how to make an intelligent guess which wine is with which strain. Now, this is one report I'd like, to have, like you to write up for yourself. Again, not too involved, but something for yourself that later on this will be helpful to you when you try to find out, try to remember just what differences one can find between different strains of wine yeast. Okay, then the, uh, let's talk about how these are, how these are graded. This will, each one of these will be worth 4% of the final, uh, of the total. There's one other thing. Now, we had, said we're going to have this discussion on hydrogen sulfide, um, on the hydrogen sulfide paper of Rankin's. Uh, I think that your preparation for that should show up a little bit. So I want to put that in here. Prep for H2S discussion. Okay, that's practically it. There are a couple other things, though. One thing that I want you to do, which you want, you're not going to get any credit for it, but uh, you have to do it if you're going to get a passing grade. I think it's uh, important to have some idea about uh, um, be somewhat creative and to um, be able to come up with some sort of research idea throughout the, during the course sometime. So I want a special research report. It can be a few sentences. It can be a paragraph is all it is. And it won't be graded on how clever it is, how good it is, uh, as long as I can read it. But you have to turn it in to get a passing grade. Is this like a research proposal? Right. Proposal, that's the word I should have used. All kinds of things have been done, and we'll discuss some of the good ones, assuming there will be some good ones, on, that, on, uh, on June 4th. There always are some very interesting ones. Got a lot of good ideas this way. So that's going to be worth zero, but you have to do it for passing grade. Now, for an A grade, you have to do one more thing. You have to do something special. You either have to write another lab report, or you have to uh, make, make the handbook really something very special. Let me know ahead of time. That's what it's supposed to be, that, it's, that, you're, not just, that you're not just turning it in for the four points, but for more. Or um, you can do any one of these. This is kind of difficult to do any of these special. Or you could do an extra uh, research report. Or you could do something else entirely different, uh, something uh, completely, um, completely uh, off the wall, is that the phrase that's used? Uh, for instance, one time uh, somebody wrote a long poem about isolating organisms. Uh, anything, anything like that, that anything extra, but you ha again, you don't get any grade for it, but you have to do it to get an A grade. All right, now what else do we have? We have the midterm and a quiz and a final. And that's 20, 10, and 20 percent. Now, we have to have some, some sort of um, judgment on the lab itself. Now, I said you don't, we won't be turning in lab reports. We won't, but I'll need results. I mean, so you don't have to put in an objective and how you did the experiment and what it all meant to you and all this. But we do need the results because we're going to use these in the, in the uh, discussions. And so, um, for just the results themselves, to make sure that you are turning in the results. Be 12, there's 
more or less 12 experiments. So there'll be 12 points for that. And then another thing, is, this is pretty subjective on my part, but I want to know how much, how much uh, you're learning in the lab or how much expertise you came in with in the first place. If you come, if you're really super duper in the lab already, it's not much you may be, on, may be able to learn. But if you weren't, if you had a lot to learn, you should be able to learn a lot. So we're going to give you 10 points for, for expertise or learning. And now we're, all, we're almost done. There's a couple of things. We've got a big lab, a lot of people in there, and you really kind of have to pay attention. I want the lab, the labs are fun, but sometimes they get to be too fun. Um, so we'll have, a, we'll have some for attention. <laughs> he does good work. He's a good boy. Yeah. And for helpfulness. Now, I'll explain that, too. I've seen some peop people just wandering around and having difficulty, and it was sometimes more difficult for me to help them than it was not to help them because, uh, well, there's a certain psychology here. And if you can help your neighbor, and I, I'll notice it, this will be another uh, four points for you. <laughs> yeah, right, there you go, yeah. So that, that should end up to um, 100 points. Now, um, we want, I want to talk about, in the short time, about malolactic fermentation, but before uh, we start, are there any questions on how things are going? I think I better call roll now before, it might, before it's too late, just to find out who's here and how we're going to organize these uh, labs. Um, well, I'll see how many people here first before I go further. Uh, this will be the people in section one that have pre-enrolled for section one. Uh, I'll, I'll talk in general about malolactic fermentation, what we need to know, these things specifically. We don't get to the, uh, we don't get to the, the uh, lab experiment itself. We'll do that before, this, before the uh, lab. Well, as I said, there's two main aspects. There's the practical aspect. How does a winemaker handle malolactic fermentation? And then there's the other aspect of uh, <clears throat> what's going on as far as this, the organism itself is concerned. Now, we're going to learn both because I think this is very important. The more we know about the fundamental aspects, the better shape we'll be as far as knowing about the practical aspects. For example, work has been done in this laboratory to to find out about the inhibition of fumaric acid. We can apply that information. We also have learned that malic acid stimulates the growth of the organisms in some cases. We can apply that information. But what we want to talk about in the next few minutes is about the control of the malolactic fermentation from a practical standpoint, from the winemaker's point of view. And I've listed some objectives of the lecture uh, that we'll try to cover the, uh, now, if not, we'll let, the, let them go until the uh, middle of the quarter. What is the fermentation and what, what causes it? Some of you may not be aware what, what we're even talking about, about the malolactic fermentation. Well, it, it is a bacterial fermentation, bacterial growth that, that occurs in the wine during storage, almost always after the alcoholic fermentation. There are some rare cases where we'll talk about where it might occur at the same time. But generally, it occurs later. It's, uh, uh, wine is a very hostile environment for uh, organisms to grow. We have, or things that we have uh, that contribute to this hostility. We have uh, high sulfur dioxide. We have low temperature. We don't have much nu many nutrients there. The yeast have already used up a lot of nutrients. We have a low pH. All these things work together uh, so that you wouldn't expect any fermentation to occur, but the thing is we have lots of time and the storage. And although these bacteria grow very slowly, they do grow. And they grow logarithmically. And so one day you don't see them, and the next day they're there. And they will, they'll carry out this fermentation. And what, one of the things that, what, one of the most important things that happens is not only the yeast, um, pardon me, the bacteria grow, but they also convert malic acid to lactic acid. And this reaction we'll just write right now for simplicity's sakes as a straight decarboxylation.
That's L lactic, I mean L malic to L lactic. Now what causes it? Well, there are certain uh, lactic acid bacteria that will tolerate these low pHs, and generally the ones that we have found to be malolactic have been in three genera. Lactobacillus, lactobacilli, uh, Leuconostox, and Pediococci. Different species within these three genera. Well, what changes do occur? Well, one of them I mentioned already. There's this conversion of malic acid to lactic acid. And this is a decarboxylation, right? This is a, a loss of acidity. You're losing one carboxyl group. So one of the things that's occurring is a deacidification. De and this is an important aspect in areas where there's too much acid to begin with. And it's, it's used, it's required, as they say, for wines, uh, red wines of France, and white ones too, to deacidify the wines, especially in um, cooler years where you have so much malic acid. We always talk about tartaric acid being the most prominent organic acid in grapes, but in Europe, there's more malic acid than there is tartaric acid, usually. Well, what other changes occur? Well, there are some end products that are formed by the, uh, by the bacteria. Uh, besides giving you lactic acid and carbon dioxide, there would be, uh, from, from residual sugars or other nutrients there, you can get all sorts of chemicals. Some of these uh, tasteless and odorless, but some of them having a taste. Uh, diacetyl is one that comes to mind. Well, I'll have a chance to smell that one of these days. And if, while it's there, while it's not there in very large amounts, it's a very uh, flavorful uh, compound. Now, this, these end products can add complexity to the wine. You know, one of the things that the, the, this department stresses is that complexity, how you increase complexity of wine, you're going to increase the quality of the wine, make it better. And if these, even diacetyl, the, the, the uh, story we're, we're telling anyway, is that even when diacetyl is there at very low levels, maybe threshold, just sub-threshold, it contributes to the complexity of the wine. We have some data to show that malolactic fermentation will add to complexity. Yeah. Uh, one part per million. Uh, if it's much more than that, then it's spoilage. That's the other aspect about end products. We can get spoilage. Malolactic fermentation can be considered a spoilage fermentation. And it was in California. When people didn't think we had it very much, they thought it was a spoilage and uh, uh, didn't, didn't admit that they did have it. Um, I often talk about the malolactic, that the mal does not come from the word meaning bad. It comes from malic, from apple, uh, the malic acid in apples. Um, another, so we have a deacidification, we have a, we're bringing end, pro, end products, new end products into the wine, which may be good or bad, and we're doing something else. We're utilizing, up, we're utilizing nutrients in there, in the wine, so this brings about a stability, a microbiological stability. In other words, if the malolactic fermentation hasn't occurred, hasn't occurred it's, very, it's likely that it can occur, and it will occur, and so the wine is unstable, much like grape juice. And so you've... One of the changes that has occurred is you've brought about stability to the wine, microbiological stability. Now, yeah. No, it's more than just the pH. pH is part of it. That's true. That you, sometimes you're increasing the pH quite a bit, usually not too much. That would tend to allow it to be susceptible to another fermentation. But I don't know of any case where there's been a natural uh, secondary, uh, uh, another bacterial contamination after the malolactic fermentation. Now, you can get it to go. You can add malic acid, and you can get the bacteria to grow again. But um, without the malic acid, I don't, I don't know of any cases. They've been reported in, in, in the field that that's happened. In the field, I mean, in a, in a winery. Um, well, which of these are the most important? Well, I think uh, most people would say that the deacidification is most important because it's the thing that's been st stressed historically. I don't think that's important in California. I really think that's one of the least, things, least important things. Why? Because most wines in California, if they're too, too low on acid, are going to be acidified. You're going to add acid to it anyway, so you don't really worry about the loss of acidity. 
I think the stability is the most important part. That you have a wine that, that uh, is susceptible to the malolactic fermentation and it has undergone it, then you know that you can bottle it. Or if it hasn't undergone it, you, and you know the conditions, you try to, try to discourage it and prevent it from going. This complexity is, uh, I like to talk about uh, that as being important, but the data that we have indicate that the, that the beneficial aspect are very small. It takes a, a lot of tastings and a good panel to pick up these differences. What we did was ferment with several different bacteria and then analyze them uh, by do a taste analysis and do it rank, rank them in order of preference and we were, were able to tell differences but the differences weren't really big. Of course it is important uh, about the complexity if you get a spoilage organism and you get a bad uh, fermentation there you I won't discount that. Um, well are these good or bad I think it's again the same thing it depends on on what you're talking about if your wine is if your wine is too high in acid and you have to deacidify it, this is a way to do it. On the other hand, uh, if you're low in acid, you're going to add acid anyway. It doesn't really matter. The same with the stability. That's very important. That especially if you're one of the biggest bugaboos is that you might want to be bottling just the time the malolactic fermentation is about to occur. And then we'll go into some details about that. That can be really frustrating to a winemaker. Say he wants to bottle in January or February some of these new type, new Beaujolais type wines. Uh, you're just taking a chance that the fermentation is going to go on in the bottle. But we'll uh, talk about that. How does the winemaker decide to encourage or discourage the malolactic fermentation? Well, he, I think he decides, if he's smart, he decides, well, is the wine going to, going to undergo it or is it not? If the chances are that it's going to undergo it, let's encourage it and get it over with, get it out of the way. If we don't think it's going to go, let's inhibit it and prevent it. Now how does he decide? That's uh, not so easy, but pH I think has a lot to do with it. I think in California, if we say the pH is 3.3, we're, you're, you're really uh, in difficulty about whether it's going to go or not. If it's greater than pH 3.3, you're going to have difficulty stopping it. If it's less than pH 3.3, you're going to have difficulty getting it to go. Does this apply equally to red and whites? No, I'm thinking mostly reds. Yeah, excuse me, reds. I have to say that most of the conversation, most of the discussion I've just been made has been with red wines. Those, that's the most important ones in California. There are other reasons uh, that the whites don't go so well, besides pH and nutrients from the skins and more SO2. Well, we have one more question here. What factors influence his decision? Well, pH is the important one. I think he has some knowledge. He knows if his barrels have a good microflora and have an organism that has tended to bring about malolactic fermentation in the past. You want to keep that in mind. Also, if it's his own wine, he knows how long it's been on the lees before the first racking. He knows how much SO2 he's added. He knows how much, uh, what temperature he has kept it. He knows the uh, titratable acidity as well as the pH. Um, we're not, we haven't got into the, uh, the experiment itself, which follows naturally from this, but at the time is up. So um, the people from section one will meet over in the fermentation building uh, a little bit uncomfortably, I'm afraid, today. And the rest of you come tonight at, uh, at least for tonight, come at 7 o'clock. Fermentation room? Yeah. Yeah.